Um, so this, these next couple of weeks, uh, y'all are stuck with me. Um, and this, or uh, for good or ill, this is this is what's happening during Sunday school. Um, okay. So um, we're in the midst of we did talked about Christmas hymns back in December. So uh, these are not quite as popular, but let's talk about some Easter hymns since. We are in the middle of Easter tide at the begin towards the beginning, but we are in the middle of the great fifty days of celebration, uh, and it is supposed to be fifty days of celebration, joy, uh, glory, all of that put away that we fasted during Lent, and so now we get to celebrate uh, parties, food, all of the above, and of course Easter tide starts with Easter Day. And then we have several uh, Sundays, but there's also two other important uh, days that are involved as well um, that are later on. We have Ascension Day, which is always on a Thursday because it is the 40th day of Easter uh, when Jesus was ascended into heaven. Um, and we also have Pentecost in Easter Tide, which is the 50th day of Easter um, when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples. So because of that, I want to look uh, at some hymns from the 1982 hymnal uh, that are usually sung during Easter hymns. Some of the, Most of them are going to be Easter hymns about the resurrection or something. Uh, some of them might be about the Ascension or Pentecost because those are part of Eastertide, um, and even though they're later on uh, several weeks down the road. Um, but since uh, Easter is so long, uh, there's often some other hymns that we start singing uh, during Easter that have some Easter themes uh, of the resurrection and Alleluia and everything. Uh, but uh, they're not technically Easter hymns. They're just general hymns. Uh, so next week, we might be uh, covering some of those general hymns, like Alleluia, Sing to Jesus, um, and just uh, some other ones that we might be singing during Easter time. Uh, but not uh, Easter hymns specifically. And again, um, as I said in December, uh, my background is in literature, uh, and so text and poetry of these hymns is much more important to me, um, I think, at least on this. The music is glorious, especially at Easter. Um, wonderful, wonderful music. But uh, I think a lot of the theological depth, of course, uh, is in the poetry, so... Uh, we'll look at that. So um, I, again, I want to look at the biblical, before we dive in with the hymns, I do want to just take a quick brief look at the biblical undergirding of what's going on with the Easter hymns. And so we'll go through all of those up uh, things up front in just a minute and each in a little bit more detail. But I do have uh, noted at the bottom these hymns are not as interested in recounting the Easter story. Uh, if you remember Christmas carols, they often will start singing about uh, the angels and the, the manger scene and everything, which is wonderful, great, great at Christmas. But the Easter hymns usually are not as concerned with giving a nice long narrative of what happens at the tomb. They talk about the tomb sometimes. They might mention something else that happens at the Feast of the Resurrection at Easter. But what the real focus of Easter hymns usually is on diving into the theology of the resurrection or in what the meaning of the resurrection is for us spiritually today. Um, so they're not usually as concerned with having a nice story about uh, the women went to the tomb and the women saw this, the angels were there, told them to go off. Uh, they really want to look behind the scenes a little bit more. So let's, first off, uh, there's that great, wonderful Hebrew word. We stop saying this word for Lent, um, and so co it comes back with a vengeance at Easter. A good vengeance, but uh, it's the word hallelujah. Um, and in Latin and Greek, it is alleluia. And almost all of these hymns, almost without exception, have some form of this word, especially the Western hymns, uh, because it is a word that literally means praise God. Halle, uh, Hallel, uh, praise, and then Yah, God. 
Um, but this praise God is both a term of praise to God in and of itself, just an exclamation of praise God, but it's also a call to, uh, for us to praise God as well. So it's got kind of a semi double meaning that we should be praising God and we should be calling ourselves in these hymns to praise God. And so hallelujah will be all around in just a minute. So if Alleluia is uh, Greek and Latin, what is Alleluia? It's the Hebrew version, the original Hebrew, uh, which is written in nice Hebrew script right above and then transliterated right below. So that that is what Hallelujah looks like in Hebrew. Um, yeah. So, um, oh, cool. So um, the next part uh, of the biblical undergirding, we do have to have some idea of the resurrection um because otherwise there is no easter but we don't want to they don't spend too much time and we'll just we heard all this last week in church and we'll hear about it in sunday school in more depth in the next two weeks from now and uh go ongoing uh so we won't discuss in great detail um but there was an empty tomb jesus was raised from the dead women showed up to the tomb when it was empty expecting to see jesus's body there and it wasn't. Um, and then there were angels, of course, to proclaim that Jesus is raised from the dead. So that's uh, kind of kind of important to have in mind. Um, but we'll discuss all that more in detail later. But the, the biblical story that actually gets picked up in these Easter hymns the most, surprisingly, is actually the Exodus. The Exodus plays a huge role. Uh, a part in a lot of Easter hymns, um, both the going through the Red Sea with Moses, you have the Passover lamb, um, which Passover is also uh, the word Paschal. Um, and slight side note real quick, most uh, languages for the word for Easter, we use a somewhat pagan Germanic term, uh, but most uh, languages in the Christian world actually use some sort of word for Passover as their word for Easter. So this is hugely important uh, still. And we taught we have that candle, the Easter candle. It is called the Paschal candle, which comes from the Passover word. So the Passover, when um, the Israelites all had lambs uh, that they sacrificed before they left Egypt, they put the blood over the mantles to save them, uh, to deliver them. The, the angel of death would pass over, pass over literally, uh, them uh, when uh, the angel of death was killing the firstborn of Egypt. Um, so that is really important. Passover, the lamb, the symbolism of the lamb uh, being sacrificed at Passover as well. Uh, then the crossing through the Red Sea uh, and the people of the Israelites all pass through the Red Sea because it parts. Um, and then Pharaoh's army tries to go through and the water come, comes over them and drowns them. Um, and one thing also later on, and this isn't, this is part of the Exodus, but not uh, exactly. But the, the man in the wilderness is also a, a theme that comes up from time to time uh, as well. The people are, God gives the people food and manna uh, to eat. And so like I, I noted down below, this is really seen by Christians as the prototype uh, for the resurrection, that God delivers his people uh, through water, hint, hint about baptism, um, that uh, God delivers his people from death um, and liberates them, um, delivers them, and that the resurrection of Jesus is really a new uh, Passover, uh, but a Passover writ large for all of humanity. Okay, so that's one end of the Bible. Now we're at the clear other end of the Bible. Uh, in the book of Revelation, we had just been talking about that uh, for since fall, uh, just finished up a few weeks ago. Um, and so the book of Revelation, a lot of the imagery from the book of Revelation is uh, used in uh, the in a lot of our Easter hymns, um, especially, Again, that lamb, the Passover lamb, but the lamb of God that's at the center of the book of Revelation, that's slain, that's dead, 
and yet is still standing somehow. Uh, this is going to be huge uh, for uh, all the Easter hymns. So just keep in mind Book of Revelation and all these things while we're going through. And one last thing, uh, because this is huge for the theology of uh, of all of this. Um, it really is concerned a lot of times with the triumph. A lot of these hymns are concerned with the triumph over death or hell or the devil, uh, which can also some of those can sometimes is translated, especially in the early stuff as Hades, um, the underworld of death, kind of like hell, kind of not, but all of the above Jesus, however you kind of look at the death stuff, Jesus triumphs over it. And this is a, a snippet of a orthodox icon of the resurrection that Jesus is literally stomping on the devil on death uh, and the bars of of hell of Hades are pushed over and they meet in the sign of a cross. Um, so death is no more. Uh, and his first Corinthians uh, 15, which first Corinthians 15 is one of the longest glorious uh, explanations and discussions on the resurrection in the epistles. Um, but as Paul says, O death, where is thy, in good old King James English, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? But thanks be to God, which give us, uh, giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's that's going to be uh, heavily, heavily discuss, discussed in these hymns, that death doesn't have power anymore. Because how can death, if Jesus is the Lord of life and is life and resurrection himself, how can death even compete with that? And it can't, which is why the resurrection that Jesus just burst through um, and has been raised from the dead. So I actually, uh, starting to turn towards the hymns here, I actually want to flag this um, one hymn writer uh, real quick. Um, and his name is St. John of Damascus. Uh, he lived in eight, the 8th century, and he lived in Islamic Syria. If you're wondering why I'm mentioning him, uh, he wrote a couple of very popular hymns, um, which we'll look at just a sec. Um, they actually, one of them is, uh, last night was uh, the Orthodox Easter service. Um, that they, they have their Easter services at midnight, and it goes for a few hours. Um, they were singing some of these hymns um, that John of Damascus writes, that John of Damascus wrote, and we sang them last week. Um, so uh, he's a great hymn writer. Um, he has wonderful, wonderful hymns that we still sing, which I'll get to in just a second. Um, but he was heavily influential. Uh, he was a monk. He was a priest. He was a hymnographer. He wrote on legal stuff philosophy uh he was basically a renaissance man before way before the renaissance um in good old christian uh form and uh one side note i also do want to mention that he lived in islamic syria um and he was a heavy critic of islam um but uh the muslim uh controlled area and the he paid his christian tax that they would require of him um and they basically let him, they disagreed with him. Uh, the powers that be disagreed with him, but they let him keep writing and uh, talking about how they were wrong. Um, and so uh, just just to, for our 21st century, this is not tolerance of religions like we would like it now today, but this was back in the 8th century, a lot better in Islamic Syria than we would have had in Western Europe. Uh, so just, just keep that in mind sometimes. Uh, Things have changed, uh, but just keep that in mind. And one other thing that I do want to flag um, for John of Damascus that he wrote that is very popular in the Episcopal Church uh, is something that we use in funerals. Um, the One of the things that we do when there's a body or, or ashes is we have a commendation where we commend the, the person to uh, God's care. Um, and we say these words, give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. And then I think this is uh, this is one of my favorite parts, but you only are immortal, the creator and ma maker of mankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, 
and to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. So even in death, while we're decomposing away, um, we uh, we still praise God. Yes, Trey? What language did he write? Uh, I think it was mostly Greek. Um, he still was in a Greek-speaking area. Um, Arab, he also had some things in Arabic that I think I think he wrote in Greek and they had to be translated into Arabic usually. Um, but yeah, and this this prayer is still used by the Orthodox as well uh, at all of their memorial services. Okay, so this is kind of, we have hymns from a guy from the ninth century, but how the heck did we get him? Which brings me, I'm not going to do biographies of everyone, but these are two of my favorite people. So here we are. Uh, John Mason Neal, J.M. Neal. Um, he is heavily influential in our hymnal. Um, if you look at the back of the hymnal where it has authors a list of authors, translators, uh, sources, um, and look for the person who has the most hymns next to their name, it's him. Uh, Charles Wesley is, a, I think, a close second, but he has the most. And it's not for hymns that he wrote himself. Uh, but it was for most for translations that he did. Um, he was an Anglican priest in uh, the 19th century England. Um, he was part of the Oxford movement, uh, which means he was very high church. Um, he was, uh, there's a picture of him wearing a chasuble there. That might not seem as uh, problematic to us because priests often wear chasubles these days. But back then, um, that he actually was forbidden by his bishop to celebrate the Eucharist for I think almost a decade um, because he wanted to wear a chasuble and have candles on the altar. Um, but that was that was a big, huge deal back then. Um, they would often wear cassocks and surplices, which is the and tippets, which is like the black scarf, but cassocks and surplices are what our lay readers uh, wear at services. That's all the priests would usually wear. And so to wear these Roman Catholic vestments like a chasuble and an alb and a stole would just be horrifying uh, back then to some Anglican low church piety. Um, so he was he was a little more controversial in his time. But he was a translator of a ton of hymns. A lot of hymns that we sing, especially in Holy Week and Easter, he translated the hymn All Glory, Laud, and Honor that we sang at a on Palm Sunday and some others that we, uh, I think we talked about it in Christmas, but a lot of them that are ancient hymns in Greek and Latin, he was the first one to translate them. He was actually the first one to translate John of Damascus in the English and some other Orthodox hymns because they were always in Greek, Russian, uh, Arabic, um, but they were never translated into English before that. Okay, so he's one of my favorite favorite guys on the calendar of saints that we have now. And he is on the, I think, yes. Jimmy, was the, was the, um, the metal prayer that you just showed us mm -hmm. not part of the prayer book before? It was not until the 79 prayer book. No. Um, there was a different committal prayer, and we'll actually have a maybe either today or uh, next week. Uh, there's a, a hymn that actually references what was in there, but uh, the prayer book back then had a much, much shorter uh, burial office. You basically came, kind of either walked into the church, said a few prayers, and walked to the graveside, or just did all of it at the graveside. It was the, the I Am the Resurrection anthems, um, maybe a reading from 1 Corinthians 15, which is going to pop up a lot. Um, and it was a long reading, but that's almost all that you had back then. Um, and then like three prayers and you're done. Um, so our, our burial service has gotten much more extended. Yeah. You mentioned the um, high church mm -hmm. and low church. Mm -hmm. What is high what church? Yeah. Difference? Yeah. So low church um, is less ceremony, more Protestant looking. High church is, uh, especially back then, you basically looked like you were walking into a Catholic, Roman Catholic church pre Vatican II um, with incense, candles, uh, chasubles, stoles. Um, it, it looked Catholic. It would, it was actually the Catholic pre-Vatican II service a lot of times just in English and not in Latin. Um, so they did make sure it was in English, but uh, yeah, so it was a lot of chanting. Um, 
Very, very Catholic looking. So, okay. So let's get on to the hymns. Um, the day of resurrection. The day of resurrection, earth, tell it out abroad. The Passover of gladness, the Passover of God. From death to life eternal, from earth unto the sky. Our Christ hath brought us over from with hymns of victory. Um, so this is one of John of Damascus's hymns. The next one is as well. Um, but just this is this is one of the hymns that the Orthodox still sing. Uh, we have the nice Western, the day of resurrection, or to it out of rock. Um, the Orthodox, at least in the Greek, it's very, very different. And it we have a nice metrical translation of it, but it's not as metrical in, in the Orthodox Church, but it's um, at least the beginning of it. The day of resurrection, tell it out, you people, Pascha, the Lord's Pascha. So very different, too. But it's still the same thing. Um, Earth, tell it out, because this is just so so wonderful. God's Passover, this is this is happening for us that we from all death in life, from from death we have life. Uh, and then uh Christ has brought us over in the Passover in this new Exodus. Uh, with new with these hymns of victory, the triumph of uh, in the resurrection. And then uh, this is kind of a fairly fairly simple hymn, but it's it's one of my favorites because of the music and and its eastern uh, side. And then our hearts be pure from evil that we may see aright the Lord and raise eternal of resurrection light and listening to his accents may hear so calm and plain. His own all hail and hearing may raise the victor's strain. So uh, asking that we we be purified from any evil intentions, any uh, wrong thoughts that we have, so we can really, any sin that we have, so we can experience God's resurrection, the Lord's resurrection, of raise eternal, of resurrection light. And then I love the next part. Uh, listening to his accents may hear so calm and plain his own all hail. Um in the gospels, a lot of a lot of times the re after the resurrection, the disciples and everyone can't really tell who Jesus is because his body is glorified until he starts talking to them. And then they realize who he is. And they uh Mary in the garden thinks that he's a gardener. Uh the disciples elsewhere don't really know what's going on. Um, but then they they hear and something clicks, um, clicks with them, and then they so can praying that we we also can can hear God. Uh, proclaiming all hail and greeting us in the res Jesus, the resurrected Christ greeting us. And then we can also join in in this, uh, this uh, triumph, this victor strain, the triumph hymn uh, of the resurrection. And then the la this last verse, now let the heavens be joyful, let earth her song begin, the round world keep high triumph and all that is therein. Let all things seen and unseen their notes together blend, for Christ the Lord is risen, our joy that hath no end. As a Franciscan, this is one of my favorite verses. Um, because the resurrection matters to not just humanity. Just like the incarnation doesn't just matter to humanity. The resurrection matters to all of creation. Um, there is a new created order. Um, so let the heavens be joyful and let earth her song begin. That creation also uh, joins in the, the song of praise uh, to to God uh, for the resurrection. Let all things seen and unseen, all matter, everything that we know about and everything that we don't know about yet uh, to join in this praise. That God created everything that we know about, that we don't know about, matter, dark matter, I'm not even a scientist, but uh, or have any science background, but everything in existence and the, the stuff that science hasn't even figured out yet, everything joins in to praise God. For Christ, the Lord is risen and our joy is not going to end because of it. So it's just one of my one of my favorite pra praises of of the resurrection. Uh, there. Okay, so the second hymn that uh, John of Damascus wrote here um, is "Come, ye faithful, raise the strain." And I cannot remember, and this is much more obscure in the Orthodox Church, but they always sing this uh, on the second Sunday of Easter. Uh, but we sang it last week. Come ye faithful, raise the strain of triumphant gladness. God hath brought his Israel into joy from sadness. Loose from Pharaoh's bitter yoke, Jacob's sons and daughters, 
led them with unmoistened foot through the Red Sea waters. And then we get to retell the, the story of the Exodus again, and that's cause for celebration for what God has done in the past. That's always a good reason to praise God, uh, what he's done in the past. Uh, but there's also uh, that we're starting to get to that idea that the resurrection is the new Exodus, that we join in in this resurrection with the new Exodus and the new Passover. And so we get to shift here. Um, Tis the spring of souls today. Christ hath burst his prison and from the three days sleep in death as a sun hath risen. All the winter of our sins, long and dark, is flying from his light to whom we give laud and praise undying. I love this verse, and there's a lot going on. Um, but one of the cool things, besides just shifting to the resurrection, is Christ has burst his prison from death, literally like we saw in the icon that Death is now under his feet. Uh, the, the prison, the bars of the prison gates of, of Hades are in the shape of the cross. The Christ has burst them open. But there's a lot of natural and seasonal imagery going on. Tis the spring of souls today. As the sun hath risen, winter of our sins, long and dark, and his light. Um, so that there's a lot of imagery, especially in Easter, because this is springtime. There's a lot of imagery of the spring, we have a natural uh, flowers blooming and everything uh, with new life. And so a lot of these hymns and this one, this is a very early example of that is using that imagery of the new life uh, springing forth um, for what's going on with us theologically and spiritually. The spring of our souls, because the winter that's past the death of uh, what's happened uh, for our sins is no more because Christ is resurrected. Christ is risen. Um, and so uh, the sun has, the spiritual sun has risen up uh, and resurrected. And so we have that light. Um, so it's wonderful. And just keep that in mind about spring and uh, winter imagery, because that's going to come the winter of, of and death versus spring and new life is going to come up uh, in some other hymns as well. And then the next verse, now the queen of seasons, bright with the day of splendor, with the royal feast of feast, comes its joy to render, comes to glad Jerusalem, who with true affection welcomes in unwearied strains Jesus' resurrection. Um, again, starts with the seasons, the day of splendor. That's really a day that, unlike anything that we usually have naturally, um, but there's a couple of things that I wanted to highlight as well here, um, that it is a theme of seasons, but also a festival party, that this is a celebration, a party that God prepared for us, um, and that the queen of seasons and royal feast of feasts, those are two very ancient terms for Easter, especially the Easter vigil. Um, the queen of, the queen of feasts or the feast of feasts, uh, is how we talk about that. This is Christmas is great. I love Christmas. Christmas isn't anything quite like Easter. The incarnation is wonderful, but the resurrection of Jesus beats it hands down. Uh, so that queen of feasts, feast of feasts, is uh, the feast of Easter. So, and it, it comes to glad Jerusalem and uh, welcomes in the, the unweary that we're not tired by the all of the singing and the celebration uh, of Jesus's resurrection and that we shouldn't be tired of it at 50 days is a long time, but we should not get tired of celebrating the resurrection. And then the next verse, neither might the gates of death, nor the tombs, dark portal, nor the watchers, nor the seal hold thee as a mortal. But today amidst thine own, thou didst stand bestowing that thy peace, which evermore passeth human knowing. Um, nothing in this verse, nothing we can do. The people, the guards at the tomb couldn't stop it. Uh, the tombs, either the death's uh, doors in Hades or hell, the devil can't stop it. Uh, nothing that we can do can stop Jesus from resurrecting, from rising from the dead. Um, so, uh, and Jesus comes to us, as we'll hear about our in our gospel lesson, God, Jesus comes and stands amongst his own disciples. 
uh, after the resurrection and gives his peace, uh, which we can't uh, quite comprehend ever. We can we can contemplate it and meditate it on every single day of our life, and we still quite won't understand everything that there is about God's peace uh, and God's uh, love. So that's that's this uh, hymn. Any questions about this one? We're moving on. Okay, so this is a much later hymn. This is a much, much later hymn. It was only written in the 14th century, I believe. Um, <clears throat> still pretty old by our standards, but um, and this this hymn, uh, we'll get to the the other version. There's a the a lot of Protestant churches use a Charles Wesley hymn uh, to this same tune, um, which we also have in our hymnal in a different version, which we're actually seeing today. So I want to get to that. But um, Jesus Christ is risen today. Alleluia. Our triumphant holy day. Alleluia. Uh, who did once upon the cross suffer to redeem our loss. Jesus is risen from the dead. Um, and one of the important things sometimes in our in this verse, and this is going to come up Sometimes in our thoughts about Easter, we want to downplay the cross. We want to kind of push the, we want to jump to the resurrection and kind of not think about the pain and the suffering of the cross. And this hymn and a lot of other hymns wants to remind us that's not the case. We can't just jump from the cross, from, jump over the cross to the resurrection. We have to think about what the pain that Christ suffered and how that is glorified in the resurrection. Um, we can't just go through it. We have, or we have to go through it. We can't just jump around it. Uh, so he, Jesus is risen. It's triumphant today. Uh, and he suffered uh, to redeem us. Alleluia. Okay. And of course, okay. So uh, hymns them of praise, then let us sing unto Christ, our heavenly King, who endured the cross and grave, sinners to redeem and save. So what do we do for everything that Christ has done for us on the cross and the grave, uh, redeeming us, saving us? We sing, we uh, celebrate, we sing hymns uh, to praise God with lots of alleluias of praising God. And then again, but the pains which he endured, our salvation have procured. Now above the sky, he's king, where the angels ever sing. Again, the resurrection, what's happened afterwards, the ascension into heaven. Uh, that doesn't negate what, what happened on Good Friday. and It glorifies what happened. Uh, there's something, uh, the redemption, salvation have come through it. But we get to celebrate in the resurrection uh, that even death uh, isn't the end. Uh, the, the, the cross is there. The cross happened. Uh, death happened, but there, even in the resurrection, death is not the end. Uh, and pain is not the end. But there's a glorious resurrection arising through that. And then the last verse. Seeing we to our God above, praise eternal as his love. Praise him, all ye heavenly hosts, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Alleluia. So again, what do we do? We sing. Uh, for, praise him. Praise. Tell the angels to praise him, which the angels always do that. But tell the angels to do it anyways, to, so that we can join with them in their praise. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, a lot of hymns have a nice Trinitarian doxology, a nice little praise to the to the Trinity at the end, and this has a version of that to mention the Trinity at the end, um, just to kind of wrap everything up uh, in one last praise. So that's Jesus Christ is risen today. And then uh, we have the Charles Wesley uh, version that is usually sung by a lot of uh, Protestant churches to that tune. Um, but love's redeeming work is done, fought the fight, the battle won, Death in vain forbids him rise. Christ has opened paradise. So uh, love's redeeming work is done. Christ has done the, the work. The, the battle is done because battle can't even really happen because the devil's no match for, for Jesus. 
Uh, death tries to stop him from, from rising, but the death can't stop life itself from uh, from um, from rising from death. So it's, it's vain for death to try to do that. And Christ is open paradise again. Oops. Christ is open paradise uh, at the cross. The good thief uh, asked Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. And uh, Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Death is destroyed. Uh, so paradise is now open uh, to all people uh, through the cross and resurrection. And then the next verse lives again, our glorious king, where, O death, is now thy sting? Once he died, our souls to save, where thy victory, O grave. And again, that uh, verse from 1 Corinthians uh, 15 about what, death, it's kind of taunting death. Death, you're not even good enough anymore. Uh, de grave, uh, where is your victory? You're supposed to be killing, you're, you're supposed to be taking everyone. We're all mortals, which literally means that we're going to die. That's not not really happening. So, death, where is your sting? Right? Where is your victory? Uh, so, praise God, because they don't have a sting or victory anymore. So, so are we now where Christ has led, following our exalted head, make like him, made like him, like him we rise, ours the cross, the grave, the skies. So, where Christ has gone in the resurrection, where Christ has gone uh, through life on the cross, the grave, everything, we get to join him. Um, sometimes that means we have to go through pain, uh, but there's always resurrection at the other end of this, uh, at the end, uh, that we have to trust in that, that God will glorify um, and bring glory through everything. So, we get to join, join in the resurrection. Ball in Christ. Okay, I'm going to try to move uh, kind of quickly through. I may skip this one for right now. Well, we usually sing this hymn as um, our fraction anthem at the, when the priest breaks the bread at the uh, 1030 service um, at the Lamb's High Feast. This is also a newer one. This was only written in the 1600s. Um, it was uh, written, I believe, in the Counter-Reformation when the Catholics were trying to counter the Protestant Reformation and trying to solidify their theology. But this is a wonderful hymn. It's one of my favorites. At the Lamb's high feast we sing praise to our victorious King who hath washed us in the tide flowing from his pierced side. Praise we him whose love divine gives his sacred blood for wine, gives his body for the feast, Christ the victim. Christ the priest. There's a wonderful mix of imagery. We have Exodus imagery and Passover. Uh, we wash us in the tide. Uh, we have Revelation imagery of the Lamb's high feast. We have Eucharistic imagery of blood and body of Christ for the uh, for wine and for the feast. Christ the victim, Christ the priest, that Christ is the victim. And this is coming from the book of Hebrews, but Christ is the victim, the the sacrifice of the Eucharist in the body and blood, but he's also the one doing the sacrificing, uh, which is completely unheard of until Christianity, because it's such a weird, how can you be the one sacrificing yourself, basically? But Christ is the one offering the prayers, the praise uh, at, at the heart of it. Christ is offering the Eucharist, and Christ is also the Eucharist, um, and on the cross as well. That Christ offers himself, and himself is the, the offering. So where the paschal blood is poured, death's dark angel sheathes his sword. Israel's host triumphant go through the wave that drowns the foe. Praise we Christ, whose blood was shed, paschal victim, paschal bread. With sincerity and love, eat we manna from above. Again, we have that same mix of imagery. We the paschal blood is poured. Um, so again, the imagery of the in the Exodus of putting the blood of the lamb on the mantle, um, and death's dark angel sheathes the sword. But also, the blood of the cross uh, is what saves us uh, from eternal death. Uh, so it's kind of a double meaning. Um, Israel's host triumphant go through the wave that drowns the foe. Again, Israel, the Pharaoh's army, tries to go through the Red Sea, and the water just comes and topples in. 
And so we praise Christ whose blood was shed, the Paschal victim, the, the Passover lamb, and the Paschal bread, the bread that we eat in the Eucharist, the new Passover. Uh, with sincerity and love, eat we manna. So the Eucharist, uh, the body and blood of the body that we eat is uh, spiritually um, like a partaking of the manna that God gives, or the manna is like a prototype of the Eucharist, that a foreshadowing of the Eucharist. Mighty victim from on high, hell's fierce powers beneath thee lie. Thou hast conquered in the fight. Thou hast brought us life and light. Now no more can death appall. Now no more the grave enthrall. Thou hast opened paradise, and in thee thy saints shall rise. And this is just wonderful. Death and hell, devil, are all conquered. That's about it. That's all this verse is doing in nice, wonderful language. That the paradise is open, death is no is conquered by the resurrection, um, and we as the saints and we as the people of God get to share in paradise and in the resurrection. <laughs> Easter triumph, Easter joy, these alone do sin destroy. From sin's power do thou set free souls newborn, O Lord, in thee. Hymns of glory, songs of praise, Father, unto thee we raise Risen Lord, all praise to thee, with the Spirit ever be. Uh, so again, the Easter, the triumph of the of the resurrection, the joy that we get from that, are what destroys sin. We can't do it on our own, um, and so from that, Christ sets us free from the power of sin through His resurrection. Um, and so, what do we do again? We pray and we sing hymns. Uh, they're very, very. They're the hymns are very clear about that. We we need to keep praising God for this because God has done this for us. Uh, and so, and again, it ends with kind of a hiding doxology to the Trinity. Father, unto thee we raise. Risen Lord, all praise to thee with the Spirit ever be. So praise the Holy Trinity. Okay, quickly want to get through this one. This joyful Easter tide, away with sin and sorrow, my love the crucified hath sprung to life this morrow. Again, Christ really did die. Christ really suffered on the cross, uh, but he's really risen too. So we get to celebrate and and uh, experience both of those. And had Christ that once was slain, ne'er burst, never burst his three-day pr prison, our faith had been in vain, but now is Christ arisen, 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 is and that's how it's sung at least in the music mm -hmm. um again the, and this is actually uh, referencing in the our faith had been in vain um paul in uh first corinthians 15 again it's a long nice beautiful chapter on the resurrection you should read it or read it in chunks i highly recommend it um if christ had not been raised from the dead uh basically everything it would our faith would be in vain if we're if Christ has not really been raised from the dead, what are we doing around here, anyways? Um, so Christ is I would say Christ has really been raised from the dead, so it's not all for naught. Okay. Death's flood hath lost its chill since Jesus crossed the river. Lord of all life from ill, my passing life deliver. So, really quickly in this verse, death seeing is gone. Again, uh and then there's that image of crossing the river in death. This is a kind of a, a cross-cultural image. Uh, the most common, I think, in our mind is the river Styx, the Greco-Roman one. But it also pops up in, uh, I believe, Hindu and Japanese culture uh, references to crossing the river in death. Uh, so it's very, very common. Um, and in even some other hymns, uh, you sometimes see the Jordan River as kind of crossing the Jordan River uh, in death as well. So this is when Jesus crossed the river. Um, death lost its children the death lost all of its seeing it has no power anymore but then uh it shifts in this hymn for the rest of it from christ's resurrection uh to our death and christ being at present at our death lord uh be present and deliver me when my uh, life passes and then had christ not christ is burst forth again and then this verse my flesh and hope shall rest and for a season slumber, till Trump from east to west shall wake the dead in number. There's quite a bit going on in this verse real quick. 
Uh, like I mentioned, my flesh and hope shall rest. In the old burial office, and the guy who wrote this was actually an Anglican priest in the 19th century, I believe. Uh, but And we still use this phrase, uh, ensure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so it's kind of a, a hiding reference, an allusion uh, to uh, the burial when, when our bodies are put into the grave. Um, so when that happens, uh, when we die, our bodies are kind of going to wait in a sleep, uh, in a slumber, uh, until the second coming. Uh, until Christ comes back in all of his glory uh, at the end of time. But that and that slumber, that sleep might seem like a really long time. Who knows how long if we're, if we're waiting for it. Um, but it's still only going to be temporary. The important uh, thing is that God's going to wake us at the end of time. Um, and shall wake the dead and uh, we get to share in the resurrection uh, fully um, at that point. Okay. Then another hymn that we're singing, I'm going to try to go through this one quickly as well. Good Christians all rejoice and sing. Now is the triumph of our King, of our King to all the, the world. Glad news we bring. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. So again, Jesus has triumphed. The King has triumphed. So let's share the good news to the world and uh, say and praise God. The Lord of risen life is risen today, singing songs of praise along his way. Let all the earth rejoice and say, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Again, kind of repetitive, but what else can be done after Jesus has risen literally from the dead and life has come from death? Not much that we can do, but praise God. So praise God. And then praise we in songs of victory, that love, that life, which cannot die, and songs with hearts uplifted high, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. So we get to join in the victory hymn. It's a victory hymn, triumph. Jesus has won, um, and life cannot die. And so we sing with hearts uplifted high. In your name we bless, O risen Lord, and sing today with one accord, the life laid down, the life restored. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. So again, we bless Christ uh, for his resurrection. We join together. We join together to praise God in worship. We don't just do it individually. We come together with one accord uh, to praise the life laid down, the life that Jesus gave up for us, but that was restored. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. And then a good Trinitarian doxology. To God the Father, God the Son, to God the Spirit, always one. We sing for life in us begun. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. And then there's one more that I want to make sure that we get to because we're singing it today. Um, I will tell you it's not my favorite, but it's got some good stuff in it nonetheless. Um, alleluia, alleluia, give thanks to the risen Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, give praise to his name. That's the refrain, and I want to hold off on the refrain for just a minute. And so we have all these verses. Jesus is Lord of all the earth. He is the king of creation. Spread the good news or all the earth. Jesus has died and is risen. We have been crucified with Christ. Now we shall live forever. Come, let us praise the living God, joyfully sing to our Savior. All with that refrain throughout. So real quickly, um, Jesus is Lord. That Sometimes we just think of that. Oh, yeah, of course, Jesus is Lord. But in the New Testament, that was a religious and a political statement. Uh it's a religious statement because Lord in Hebrew is Adonai, and that was a term for God. Uh, so Jesus is God. That's a religious statement. Also, Kyrios, the, the, it was a political statement that it, they would sometimes say Kaiser Kyrios because the, Lord, the Caesar is Lord. Caesar is in charge. So in the New Testament, when we say Jesus is Lord, it's a religious statement, and it's a political statement saying that Jesus is God, and Jesus is really in charge, and Caesar isn't. Um, so that, just always keep that in mind. Whenever you hear it, because we just think of it as a nice, plain statement. Oh, yes, of course. But it is an impactful, short, but really impactful statement. And then the next, he is the king of creation, is reminiscent, uh, I think, of uh, the beginning of Jewish prayers. Uh, Blessed are you, Lord, our God, king of the universe. Um and then uh, spread the good, the next verse, spread the good news or all the earth. And in Mark 16, 
and in Matthew 28, we are supposed to proclaim the, the gospel, the good news of the resurrection and everything to uh, all people in Matthew uh, and to all creation in Mark. And the, the good news that Jesus has died and Jesus has risen. The next verse, we have been crucified with Christ. Uh, in Romans 6, uh, Paul talks about that in our baptism, we have been buried with Christ in death. So we can share in his resurrection. So we have been crucified. We have been buried with Christ in his death so that we can share in this new life uh, with him in his resurrection. Then the last verse, come, let us praise the living God, joyfully sing to our Savior. So because of all this, let's praise God again. Alleluia, alleluia. Give thanks to the risen Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Give praise to his name. Because what can we do after all this? We really can't do much except for just praise God and worship God and give him thanks. Um, so I think that's just a minute over, but uh, that's it for, that was a quick run through of a lot of them. We've got a lot more in the hymnal, so uh, come back for next week. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so. Yeah.